there are still focused tactical operations that need to happen and many terror tunnels to be uh, identified, destroyed, you know, many weapons gathered, et cetera, et cetera. So but I'm just saying that we are much closer to a full on victory over Hamas in Gaza than most people realize. This is a special report, a special edition of Inside the Epicenter. The breaking news over the weekend is that the top terrorist leader of the Hezbollah terrorist organization, uh, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, is dead, taken out by an Israeli airstrike on Friday. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg, your host and the founder and chairman of the Joshua Fund. And uh, welcome to the Inside the Epicenter podcast. I want to get right into uh, what actually happened and what it means with Lieutenant Colonel Reserves Jonathan Conriquez. He had been the IDF chief international spokesman. He's out of the reserves now, but he's a senior fellow with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He's in Israel. I'm actually in California leading the Joshua Fund's uh, annual epicenter briefing. And so this has been a big deal. I'll talk to you more about that in the second half of the show. But I want to get to you, Jonathan, right away. This news is just hours old as you and I speak. What actually happened? And then we'll talk about the import, the uh, the significance of what's just happened. Yes. Shalom, Joel. It is, um, it's a good day. It's a good day for freedom, for Israel, for democracy. It's a bad day for terrorists and the entire Iranian network. I think uh, they're having a, a few chills down their spines and it's not a good day for them because the most important non-Iranian figure uh, has been eliminated. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah was uh, chairman of uh, Secretary General of uh, Hezbollah since 1992. He commanded tremendous influence uh, on the Arab street and amongst other Iranian terrorist organizations all over the Middle East. Ever since the U.S. excellent elimination of Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general, uh, done under uh, President Trump, uh, Hassan Nasrallah rose to even larger prominence and importance in the Iranian axis of evil. I say that because this is how important today's or yesterday's events are. It's really a blow for the Iranian axis, and it's really a step in the right direction for the U.S., for Israel, and the other countries in the region who are looking to expand stability and prosperity and peace and to fight against terrorists. So, say, yeah, it's really extraordinary. And, and it goes to something you and I have been talking about for a while, because, you know, obviously Israel had its worst intelligence failure in our history, at least since 1973, um, on yeah. October 7th. And yet, one of the things, the themes that of, of yours and my conversations over the last few months is the extraordinary intelligence coups, very precise intelligence that has led to a series of Israeli assassinations of the head of Hamas, the number two uh, leader of Hezbollah in Beirut, Fuad Shukra, uh, the, the top military commander, of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, Muhammad Def, and now the the most important, as you say, non-Iranian terrorist in the world, which is Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, it it really is speaking to the the tremendous precision of Israeli intelligence and and airstrikes. Yeah, just to put things into perspective, Israel in the last two weeks has eliminated far more wanted U.S. terrorist than the U.S. has done in 20 years. Yeah. Uh, in Fuad Shukr, Hassan Nasrallah, Ali Karaki, and a few other uh, terrorists who all of them had American blood on their hands. Yes. They had American, Israeli, Lebanese, French, and other nationalities' blood on their hands. So it's really good riddance, not only for Israel and for the region, but really on a global scale. And what Israel did was, as you say correctly, rely on intelligence capabilities that Israel has been developing over years. This is, of course, you know, the stark difference, as you correctly point out, between the tremendous failure, the intel and combat failure that Israel sustained on October 7. And when you compare that to how Israel has been dealing with Hezbollah, which is a much stronger more professional and more dangerous military organization, a terrorist organization, 
uh, yet they have been completely penetrated by Israeli intelligence and Israel keeps on attacking them and decimating their leadership and stripping away their military capabilities. That doesn't come out of nowhere, and it's not something that Israel has scrambled to achieve right now. It's something that Israel has been working years on in order to carefully map their strategic locations, where they're hiding weapons under houses and inside houses. It's to map their communication systems, their logistic system, their command and control, their secret hideouts in Beirut, under buildings, in the Bekaa Valley, and in other locations. And all of this has been monitored by the IDF and Mossad, and it's been ready for execution. And once the political echelon, the elected leaders of Israel, gave the military the go-ahead, the execution was swift and, I would say, almost perfect. Now, just to make sure, Israel dropped, I think, an unprecedented amount of ordnance on the location where Hassan Asrallah and the other uh, chief terrorists were. We're talking about 83 bombs, each one of them weighing almost a ton. So a lot of explosives. Why so much? Because Israel wanted to be sure. And uh, because Hassan Asrallah's headquarters was a, a few dozen feet underneath the ground in Beirut, an area where he thought that he would be safe. And Israel... It took the necessary steps in a very accurately executed one. I'd say here that it is sad that non-combatants have died. I don't, uh, I mean, that that is an an unfortunate reality. Uh, People who may not have been, we don't know if they were Hezbollah combatants, uh, have most likely been killed. And that is, that is sad. That's not the intended result. And Israel never tries to kill civilians, even if they are, willing or unwilling human shields for terrorists. And it is uh, sad, but I think in this case, it is uh, something that couldn't have been avoided. And in order to get to Hassan Nasrallah, who has been hiding in bunkers ever since the Second Lebanon War in 2006, that had to be done. And all in all, I think a good, uh, very good and solid uh, operation that really has the potential to change the equation in the Middle East and to change the situation between Israel and Hezbollah. Well, let's get to the implications in a moment. Uh, But Jonathan Conricus, uh, a senior fellow with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, uh, served as a lieutenant colonel, was the chief IDF spokesman, international spokesman for a number of years, and has served in reserves even in this war right up through December. You you know, it's interesting. You're being uh, characteristically modest, Jonathan, but you know, you're like, it's a good day for Israel. It's a good day for democracy. Okay. Yeah. But let's put this in perspective. Israel just took out the top terrorist leader of the most dangerous terrorist organization outside of Iran, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, but not only him. Two months ago, we took out the number two. Um, But over the last month or so, let's say two months total, 18 of the top 18 Hezbollah terror leaders have all been assassinated, right? I mean, this is as well as the head of Hamas, as well as the number two in Hamas, or maybe number three, you might put Mohammed Def under Yahya Sinwar, which we've not yet gotten that we're aware of. But like, this is a level of, of impact that I think has caught all of the Iranian regime and certainly all of the people that are left inside Hezbollah in shock and in Hamas. And I would add that you and I haven't even yet talked about the extraordinary Mossad operation to wire all of some 4,000 or so pagers used by Hezbollah with explosives detonating those simultaneously or near simultaneously that either injured or killed uh, upwards of 4,000 uh, Hezbollah operatives. And then they shifted from pagers as their way of communicating to walkie-talkies. But the most recent batch of walkie-talkies that Hezbollah purchased had been wired with explosives. Hezbollah didn't notice any of this. We're talking about a level of sophistication and creativity and precision that I think is unmatched in Israeli history in terms of this magnitude. Talk about why are we being so uh, effective and creative now when we, in some ways, it feels like Israel's gotten off of its, you know, we were very badly shaken by October 7th and our failures, 
but something is really happening in recent days and weeks that is actually shocking everybody, even people who are pro-Israel. Yeah, I mean, what you described could uh, equally have been, you know, in one of your books about uh, it clandestine. Would, it would seem unbelievable, Jonathan. Yeah, this level of magnitude would have felt like okay. So come on, you yeah, can't you're pushing that, it. and you take out all the top 18 leaders of Hezbollah in in a one month period or two month period. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. It, they are tremendous achievements, and on the military level, I think they are right up up at the top of. Uh, how good you can get in terms of fusing live intelligence and the delivery of ordnance in real time in a very, very precise way, specifically at the intended military target and totally surprising your enemy. And I think that militaries around the world will have a lot of interest in seeing militaries and uh, intelligence agencies will have a lot of interest in understanding how this was done and it will probably be emulated and terrorists worldwide will be studying this as well uh, to be careful of what may happen in the future. This will have long uh, reaching ramifications and it is definitely tremendously positive. I agree with what you say. I am, you know, dampened in, term, in terms of my enthusiasm because we still have 101 Israeli hostages in Hamas captivity and uh, we have about 70,000 Israelis that have uh, f- been forced away from their homes and they still haven't been able to return. So what Israel has done by eliminating Hassan Nasrallah hopefully will lead to the uh, correct strategic situation that will allow Israelis to go back to their homes safely without the threat of Hezbollah on the border. And hopefully, in the more distant combination of events, maybe will also lead to a, a hostage deal with Hamas and the return of the hostages. Well, that would be uh, great. A huge answer. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what, you know, that's what we remind ourselves of. Yes, it's a, it's a very positive day, and we take pride and joy in the excellence of Mossad and IDF operations, but we have to remain very mindful of Uh, the real battle here, the strategic picture. And until we're back home safely in every last Israeli village in kibbutz in the north and in the south, until our people are home, hopefully alive, then this isn't over. And uh, we, well, we are mindful. Let me ask you one more question then before we go. I, I really appreciate it. And, and I want to let my uh, listeners know that uh, um, after the break, I'm going to come back with some analysis. But given that Jonathan's up past midnight, uh, it's been a very intense day. He's doing a lot of media. And I'm very grateful that he that he responded to some of my text message to say, like, are, are you up? Are you awake? Do you really have, you know, do you want to uh, talk for a few minutes? I really appreciate it, Jonathan. So one more question for now. What do you see as the most likely scenario going forward, or at least how a quick analysis? So, so there's two options here. I mean, there's probably more, but let's say two options. Scenario one is Hezbollah is so rocked by this and so paralyzed by the fact that they've lost their top 18 leaders that both the mid-level operatives and the Iranian regime decide to step back and, and not launch some massive you know, ongoing war. Uh, that would be a good scenario. But there's the other scenario in which Iran decides to authorize if they're able to contact. That's a separate question, whether they can contact the mid-level operatives. You know, normally you don't even have phone numbers for mid-level operatives, right? It goes through a chain of command and the entire chain of command has been knocked out. But assuming they can reach rocket commanders throughout Lebanon uh, for Hezbollah, What do you think Iran does? Do they, do they, I mean, last night, overnight, certainly we saw, you know, hundreds of attacks, but it seems to be slowing down a little bit here on Saturday. So what's your sense of where this goes in the coming days, um, maybe the coming weeks? Yeah. First of all, Joel, I'm, I, I'm very appreciative of your journalism. And whenever there's an opportunity, I know that you reach out to very important audiences around the world, um, God-fearing and good, honest people who are interested in what's happening in Israel, in the Middle East. And whenever there's an opportunity to speak uh, with them through you, I always appreciate that. So, I, of I course, when you reached you. out, Thank you. I said yes. Um, so the ball is definitely, I agree with your analysis, the ball is in the Iranian court. Hezbollah, in terms of being an influential player, independent player, has been relegated to a very auxiliary position 
Uh, Tehran have has taken the lead here. Uh, they're they're behind the wheel, and uh, they've first and foremost said that there's a succession uh, uh, process uh, where there's already a uh, successor nominated for Hassan Asala, and that they are in command, which of course makes it very clear what this is about. This isn't about Lebanon. This isn't about anything related to uh, uh, um, to Lebanese people. It's about Iran and it's about Hamas and the link, the artificial terroristic link that Iran creates between uh, their different proxies in order to fight against Israel. Now, the Iranians, as we know, are smart, calculating and patient. Yes, they've had their lunch eaten twice now by Israel, first with Ismail Haniya. Uh, who was eliminated in Tehran under Iranian protection, which failed, and Israel assassinated him. That was a month and a half ago. And second, now, the elimination of Nasrallah. Both are significant losses, loss of face for the Iranians. The Iranians are not one to uh, respond quickly and rashly without uh, uh, taking all of these strategic considerations. Uh, they have made statements that have been belligerent, but but pretty soft. I would have expected a bit more in terms of rhetoric. And it doesn't seem as if they have a plan and a contingency how to really deal with the situation. Now, the Iranian dilemma it's is... A, it's an unprecedented situation for the top leaders of your top, most important, most lethal terrorist organization to be removed from the battle. Which they have spent billions and billions of dollars in equipping with the best weaponry they could buy from Russia, from China, uh, manufactured in Iran. They've been trained in Iran. There were several Iranian officers killed last night when Hassan Asrallah was eliminated because they were in the bunkers with them. So it is, it's, it's a very big step back for the Iranians. Now, the dilemma for them is it's not a good situation to escalate from. Usually you try to escalate from a situation of strength. That's what military tactics and strategy tells us in teaching. And to escalate from a situation of deficit is usually not a good thing. And the Iranians are on the back foot. Now, they could have and they probably should have retaliated against Israel after Ismail Haniya was eliminated in Tehran, but they didn't. They said and they huffed and they puffed, but they didn't really do anything, maybe because they are uh, aware of the fact that Israel uh, would have the tactical ability to strike important sites in Iran. Although they want to prevent talked that. about that because Hezbollah was about to launch 6,000 or so missiles at Tel Aviv and, and central Israel. And Israel, you know, in my view, with supernatural assistance by the God of Israel, uh, figure that out, took it out ahead of time. So that may have been, that may have been the big, uh, you know, the big blowback that was coming. Uh, yeah, but that's not Iran. Iran said, okay. we are going to retaliate uh, ourselves. The okay. supreme leader of Iran, he said, we are going to retaliate. And to have their proxy do it, even though a powerful proxy like Hezbollah wouldn't have been it. So okay. th there's, there's question marks about Iranian capability, Iranian morale, Iranian willingness to fight and really to take on Israel and put their money where their mouth has been. And so far they haven't. Now, if they do, that will open up a whole door, a room of opportunities for Israel, for America as well. But I think Israel will capitalize on it. And if Iran attacks Israel again, I think Israel will be effectively defending itself and then uh, taking the opportunity to strike Iran and really change the balance in the region. And this is perhaps the most important thing. You know, we've been talking about details, Hassan Nasrallah, Ismail Haniya, Yichya Sinwar, the leadership of Hezbollah in Lebanon, etc., etc. But the bottom line is, until the Iranian regime is either removed or otherwise convinced to stop its uh, strategy of aggression in the region, the region will not see stability and peace. We will have continued fighting and warfare, terrorism, instability, misery, and suffering as long as the Iranian regime is in power to do so and as long as they pursue the same strategy. And uh, there are, I think, two countries in the world that have anything meaningful to say and do about it. One is Israel and the second is America. It would be great if our two countries would 
work together hand in hand in a plan that is designed to liberate the Middle East from the Iranian, the Islamic Republic of Iran for the sake of prosperity and peace, for the sake of uh, human rights, of democracy. I don't know if there will be democracy in many Arab states, but at least to preserve the region's only democracy, which is Israel. Um, and that is, you know, the bottom line that we have to be, I think, mindful of uh, as we rejoice this day of uh, when uh, Hassan Asala, a big uh, and uh, a terrorist that has lots of American blood on his hands, he is no longer here. He will not be terrorizing anybody. And uh, that's a good thing. But we have to be mindful of the strategic situation. And there is still a lot of big fish to fry, the biggest one being the Islamic Republic of Iran. Well, one of those fish is definitely frying now. Uh, Jonathan Enriquez, uh, thank you very much for taking the time uh, past midnight in Israel on a huge day, uh, strategic developments, uh, the, the, uh, the removing of uh, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, the terrorist organization in Lebanon, removed from the battlefield, uh, assassinated in a massive airstrike by Israel in his own headquarters. He never saw this coming. And uh, it's a it's a huge uh, day of success. And uh, I appreciate your uh, your insight and your analysis. God bless you and uh, get some sleep, my friend. Thank you, Joel. All the best to you. Thank Shabbat you. Tov. Appreciate it. When we come back, we'll have more with Inside the Epicenter. We'll do more analysis of what's happening. Uh, don't go away. Welcome back to this special edition, uh, the special report of uh, Inside the Epicenter. Big development in the Epicenter uh, on Friday, uh, September uh, 27th. Uh, the uh, assassination of the top terrorist leader, in the world, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, the head, uh, the spiritual, political, military leader of the Hezbollah a terrorist organization funded by Iran, trained by Iran, armed by Iran, uh, and directed by Iran. Hassan Nasrallah is, uh, was 64 years old, and he'd been in charge of Hezbollah for 32 years. Uh, or so, um, certainly around 30 years. And it's really um, it's taken the world by shock and certainly the radical Islamist world by shock, waking up to the news, uh, the confirmation uh, that Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah is no more, that he was killed in his own headquarters, uh, in the center of this Beirut community uh, where he has underground facilities, uh, this headquarters, dozens of feet underground, apartment buildings and various complexes above him. Um, he thought he was invulnerable. He was wrong. I'm very grateful to Go Jonathan Conriquez, the former chief IDF spokesman uh, for international media, lieutenant colonel in the reserves in Israel and, and a senior fellow with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. And I want to give a little bit more analysis in this special report in just a moment. But let me first read the passages that came to mind uh, from the scriptures uh, when uh, we began to report the news at All Israel News um, on Saturday. I, again, I want to mention that I'm uh, in Carlsbad, California, uh, for the last few days doing, uh, leading what's called the Joshua Fund's Epicenter Briefing. It's a time when we invite uh, key uh, ministry leaders, prayer partners, donors, prospective donors, and others to come for an educational briefing to learn what's happening in Israel and the broader is Arab Islamic world. Uh, and obviously this year, uh, because of wartime and because we're so close to the one year anniversary of the horrific events of, September, of October 7th, 2023, this epicenter briefing has probably been the most important we've ever had. And it was right in the middle of this briefing that uh, we woke up to the confirmation that, in fact, Sheikh Hassan Azrava was dead in this massive airstrike. Uh, took place, the airstrike, airstrikes took place on uh, Friday. Uh, and then the confirmation came on Saturday uh, that Nasrallah was dead. And, and I, my, my thoughts immediately turned to Psalm 37. The entire Psalm would be appropriate, but I'm going to read from verse 35 through the end of verse 40. And I think you'll see how, you'll see why this is the passage that uh, uh, the Lord put on my heart. The psalmist writes, I have seen a wicked, violent man 
spreading himself like, like a luxuriant tree in its native soil. And then he passed away, and lo, he was no more. I sought for him, but he, he could not be found. Mark the blameless man, and behold the upright, for the man of peace will have a posterity, but transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord, the Lord helps them and delivers them who are righteous. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Psalm 37, verses 35 through 40. So that's the passage that's on my heart today. Some prayer requests out of that. The first thing is, I'd like you to join us. Uh, let me share what I shared when I walked people through this uh, as they woke up and, and we began our Saturday session at the Epicenter Briefing. The first thing I said is we need to pray that the Lord would liberate Lebanon from the reign of terror of Hezbollah. Obviously, we also want to pray that Israel herself is liberated from this threat. Uh, they have 150,000 missiles aimed at us, and they've been firing uh, almost 10,000 of them. Um, and uh, it's been a serious problem. Israelis have had to move away from this border, about, uh, about 70,000 of them. And about a million Israelis in the northern tier have been affected, uh, running to their bomb shelters, living in their bomb shelters as uh, rocket fire, missile fire from Hezbollah in southern Lebanon has intensified. But... It's not just that we as Israelis want to be liberated from this threat. We want to pray that God would liberate Lebanon from the Iranian octopus, as it were, uh, that, that's trying to surround and strangle uh, Israel and the Jewish people. And they're using, the Iranian regime is using Lebanon. Hezbollah has effectively taken over Lebanon over the last several decades, and used it as their base camp to attack Israel and to prepare to annihilate Israel. And yet, um, the tide has turned, uh, and at least 18 of the top 18 Hezbollah leaders have been taken off the battlefield, killed by Israeli efforts, Israeli military and intelligence efforts. Uh, just in the last few weeks, more than 4,000 Hezbollah operatives have been severely injured, and many of the, some of them killed when those uh, pager explosions went off almost simultaneous, simultaneously all across Lebanon, and the walkie-talkie explosions as well, as we talked about in the first half of the podcast. So I just want you to know that most Lebanese citizens are horrified and sickened by Hezbollah and the Iranian regime. They don't want to be uh, a province of the Iranian regime. They don't want to have Israel invade and attack Lebanon. They, they've been through that before. They don't want a fight with Israel. In fact, I want to say something I didn't actually mention at the uh, Epicenter Briefing so far. I may mention it tonight. My prayer is that the whole Hezbollah infrastructure and terror network would be ripped out by the roots out of Lebanon and either destroyed or sent back to Iran. And that the Lebanese citizens themselves, as they recover, would want to join the Abraham Accords and make peace with Israel. Now, prophetically, I can't say for sure that's going to happen. We know in Ezekiel 38, 39, eventually Russia, Iran, Turkey, other hostile forces to Israel will come through Lebanon and through Syria against the mountains of Israel, against the people of Israel. But it's interesting that in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it doesn't actually say that the people of Lebanon or Syria will be at war with Israel. So that's just something to ponder. Why not? I can't give you a, de a definitive answer, and this is not a podcast mostly about Ezekiel 38, 39. But I, but I wonder if, if we're going to see a period of peace and security between Israel and Lebanon that would help set up for 
the time that Ezekiel 38 described as the prerequisites uh, before the war of Gog and Magog happens, that Israelis are feeling secure. And a, a massive victory over Hezbollah in Lebanon and over Hamas in Gaza would certainly set those preconditions in a very dramatic way. I do think that's where we're heading, but whether it turns into an actual treaty between Lebanon and Israel and Abraham Accords type treaty, that, you know, it's, that's uh, speculation. Something to pray about, I'm not sure about. Uh, obviously, we also want to pray for the liberation of Gaza from the reign of terror of Hamas, and that is getting closer. We'll need to do a different podcast about that, but I just want to encourage you that much of the infrastructure of the Hamas terror uh, regime ha has been ripped out, has been decimated. Yes, it has come at, at a very high price uh, for Israel in terms of our military, in terms of our families, but also in terms of international reputation and so forth. But still, uh, all these tensions and fighting in against Hezbollah in Lebanon ought to have triggered thousands and thousands of rockets and terror attacks from Gaza. But they have not come. Why? Because that infrastructure is pretty much destroyed. That doesn't mean things are over, that war operations by Israel in Gaza are over. No, there are still Hamas operatives. They still have weapons. There are still focused tactical operations that need to happen and many terror tunnels to be uh, identified, destroyed, you know, many weapons gathered, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I'm just saying that we are much closer to a full on victory over Hamas in Gaza than most people realize. And, and now we've, uh, you know, taken out uh, the top 18 leaders of Hezbollah. So where does that lead? I don't know. I'm not going to try to predict for you. I, you know, you heard me ask, uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the reserves, Jonathan Conricus, what does he think going to happen next? I, I, I wouldn't say he dodged that question, but he, he doesn't know either, right? He, he, his point was, uh, this is the ball. The, he, what he said was the ball is in the Iranian regime's court. They've got to make some decisions. They're not the type of military strategist to, to take rash action. They tend to be, you know, they're, they're, Iran is the country where chess was invented. So Iranian, Iran's regime tends to think several moves ahead. This, these were not moves that they anticipated coming, right? That Israel would take out um, the, the top uh, Hezbollah uh, leadership so quickly, so decisively. And in fact, I don't think they ever imagined that Israel would bomb the actual headquarters district of Hezbollah in Beirut. I don't think they ever saw that coming. Otherwise, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah would not have been there, right? But he felt safe and he was wrong. So those are some things to be praying about. I look forward to telling you more about the inside the epicenter briefing. That is gonna be a really a fun conversation. There's lots to tell you about. I'm gonna tell you something that we haven't told anyone else yet, but you are entitled to know because you're inside the epicenter listeners and viewers. And and that is that uh, we had a keynote speaker on Thursday night to open up the session. And it was the former prime minister of Israel, uh, Naftali Bennett, who was our keynote speaker. He gave a fascinating assessment of what happened on October 7th, uh, that horrific day from his own vantage point as a former prime minister of Israel, as a former defense minister of Israel, as a former special forces commando in Israel's most elite uh, special forces unit, Sayeret Matkal, he fought uh, in Gaza, he fought in Lebanon, and, and he knows these two theaters very, very well. It was a very interesting opening keynote address. And then um, we had a session of questions and answers that I moderated, but we had questions uh, from uh, the audience. Really interesting. And uh, I'll be talking to you more about that uh, in an upcoming podcast. We also had a very interesting a series of speakers, Israeli and Arab pastors and ministry leaders who have enormous experience and insight in what God's doing on the front lines of this regional war that we're in. And it was really interesting to hear from them. Again, I'll share uh, insights, tidbits from them. It's going to take a little, a little while so we can uh, play audio from uh, some of those key moments, but we will. 
Uh, but I wanted you to be aware that the Inside the Epicenter podcast is going to be a place where you can learn about this uh, very special event. Now, you're, you may be asking, well, how come I didn't even know there was an Inside or, or an Epicenter briefing? Well, that's because it wasn't an Epicenter conference where we would have told you and everybody could come. But this was an invitation only, mostly off the record event for um, key prayer partners, and uh, ministry allies of the Joshua Fund. Uh, it was not designed to be exclusionary, just to be clear. It was designed to be intimate. And so we had about 150 people attending, and, and that gave us the opportunity to uh, to share things with people and to take their questions and to help brief key partners and ministry allies and donors and prospective donors uh, and educate them about what's really happening. Uh, we won't be able to share all that we shared with that group, but we're going to share quite a bit. And I look forward to to uh, uh, to doing that in a future podcast. But given uh, the the import, the magnitude of this assassination of Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, uh, we wanted to do this special report. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, please keep praying for the Joshua Fund. This is a time where uh, we need your prayers. And um, if God so moves you, we could use your, your financial support. The needs on the ground in terms of humanitarian relief, in terms of strengthening the local church, in terms of educating the global church about uh, what's really happening, telling the truth in an age of lies, uh, these needs are expanding enormously. And not just in Israel and among the Palestinians, but in these neighboring Arab countries like Lebanon, like Syria, and so forth. So I would encourage you to go to joshuafund.com. Again, joshuafund.com, and you can learn more about this ministry, and you can make a secure, a tax-deductible online donation. And I would encourage you to do that if the Lord so moves you. We need your support. Yes, uh, our, our income has increased quite dramatically over the last year, and we're very, very grateful as, as the Lord has moved on your hearts to help. Uh, but I will say that as, as wonderful as that's been, the needs have far outpaced and the opportunities have far outpaced uh, what we currently have a budget to do. So um, just trying to be faithful to what the Lord is, the doors that he is opening for us and the needs that we see before us. I just want to let you know we absolutely uh, could use your help absolutely in prayer as well as financial support. Again, you can go to joshuafund.com. You can learn more about Jonathan Conricus in the show notes. And um, and you'll see a link also to the All Israel News story that uh, uh, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah was uh, eliminated, assassinated on Friday, September 27th. And you can learn more about him and learn more about what happened and some of the implications of it. And I encourage you also to go to allisrael.com. You can sign up for the free uh, email newsletter. So every single day, except Saturdays usually, uh, uh, you'll get... Uh, a free email with all the top headlines from All Israel News. Uh, all Israel News is is uh, funded in a dramatic and large way by the Joshua Fund because it's part of the educational arm and the, the uh, educational strategic initiative and focus of the Joshua Fund. And so that's why we're doing so much work together. So I would encourage you, that is a great way to keep up on and be aware of what is happening, the good, the bad, the ugly, and how to pray about it, um, allisrael.com. So hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this special report. Please share it with others. And um, please uh, give your comments. Um, and uh, and uh, if you haven't ever subscribed to this, please do subscribe to this podcast and leave us your comments uh, on whatever podcast platform that you enjoy and, and, and rate us highly. We would be grateful if you find this helpful. Um, uh, Lynn's not, Lynn is uh, with me here in California, but she is meeting with um, many of the, uh, the guests and participants uh, at the, and, and speakers here at this conference, this epicenter briefing. So that's why she's not on this podcast. But given, again, how big a deal this is, we felt we absolutely needed to record one today. And I'm super grateful to Jonathan Henriquez for uh, making some time for us. Thank you so much from Carlsbad, California. I'm Joel Rosenberg, founder, co-founder, and chairman of the Josh Fund. Thank you for listening to this very special edition of Inside the Epicenter.
Hey, I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.